<clears throat> Tolkien began The Hobbit um, as a story for his children. And it, it progressed with him telling it to his children. <clears throat> but before he began telling it to his children, its original genesis, let's say, began one morning when he was marking exams for University of Oxford. I think these were entrance exams. Uh, and he was sitting in his study, which was a room over their garage. Um, I think this is on his Sandfield home. He, he lived in three or four, during his time in Oxford, he lived in three or four different houses. Um, and if I had the pictures on here, I'd show it to you. But he was sitting in there. He had the windows open, a nice breeze blowing through. And he had essentially a student's blue book. Okay? And he was reading it, marking it. And he turned it over and just out of the blue wrote on the back, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And stopped. Because he didn't know what it meant. He didn't know what a hobbit was at that point. He had not created hobbits in the Silmarillion stories, since hobbits don't show up in the Silmarillion. Um, and so it, it took him a while to figure out what that meant. And that's, he began developing the story and began um, reading it to his children or telling it to his children. He had four children. And once the the manuscript got written. He was also telling it to the to the Inklings group at the same time. Um, the Inklings said, "You know, this is good. You ought to publish it, etc." And so what Tolkien did after he had it typed up, he sent it off to a publisher in London. And the publisher's name was Stanley Unwin. And he sent it off to him. And Unwin gets it. And, it, you know, it's this egghead English professor from Oxford. You know, he doesn't know what to think. It's about hobbits and dragons and dwarves. And he doesn't really want to read it. So he gives it to his 10-year-old son named Rayner. R-A-Y-N-E-R. Rainer Unwin, and his 10-year-old son reads it and writes his father an evaluation of it. Types up, I think it is a, about a one-page, um, essentially a recommendation to publish. And on the basis of one recommendation, that of his 10-year-old son, Stanley Unwin publishes the Lord publishes um, the Hobbit, and if I remember correctly, and I could get on the internet, but I'm not going to. If I remember correctly, its initial print run is is only like 500 or 1500 copies. It's very very small. For the simple reason that he doesn't, he's not sure if this is going to make much money, if any money. Okay, he prints it. They sell out. Does another printing. The, no, the next printing is larger. They sell. Does another printing. They sell. Okay. And by the end of 1937, Tolkien is almost a household name, at least in England. The book has, has spread that quickly by word of mouth and such. Okay. It's on the basis of the publication of The Hobbit that he gets invited to do the Andrew Lang Lecture at St. Andrews University. Okay? It is immediately, you can go back, you know, um, get online and do a search of Times Literary Supplement or TLS um, book reviews. And you can read early book reviews from 1937 in the TLS. Time Magazine had one. Um, Life Magazine, I think think had one. I'm not positive about that. But the early reviews are pretty much uniformly very positive. That, you know, 
This is a modern classic, a modern instant classic, which is kind of anachronistic if you understand, you know, classic means it's past the test of time. So how could it be an instant classic and yet past the test of time? All right. Now you have to understand that prior to the publication of this, Tolkien had published some other stuff. Now, he wasn't an unknown author. He was unknown in the sense of fiction, however. <laughs> Everything he had published prior to this was largely academic. Right? Um, we didn't talk about it, but you read his Beowulf essay. Beowulf, the monsters, and the critics, which is from 1936. Okay. In the 20s, late 20s, no, mid 20s, um, he published with Evie Gordon an edition of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which was very significant. Uh, it is still a commonly used edition of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Um, he published a essentially a glossary or almost a dictionary to a volume of verse called 14th Century English Verse. Tolkien did all of the lexical material for that volume at the back of it. And he published a couple or a variety of... Um, quote-unquote, research articles. I say quote-unquote because they're not research articles like people today think of research articles as these, you know, 20, 30, 50 page long, extremely obtuse, very dense, usually worthless um, pieces of research in very mundane things. They were often in very mundane, very archaic, uh, very... Uh, esoteric subjects, but they were subjects that dealt primarily with aspects of the history of the English language. For example, a word, a single word, and how it is used over time, or a single word from a very narrow dialect area in England. So, you know, in, in terms of scholarly circles, Tolkien was well known. This thing put him on the international map. I mean, this, this made Tolkien internationally famous among Anglo-Saxonists, which, you know, is not necessarily a huge group of people. Um, you know, all 20 of them, so to speak. I mean, it was quite a bit larger than that, but um, for the simple reason that what he does in the Beowulf essay, and this has a huge impact on uh, The Hobbit, is that Tolkien is the first modern scholar, meaning the first 20th century, let's say, scholar, to really read the Old English epic poem Beowulf as an Old English epic poem, rather than as a piece of material that can be read for historical information. See, prior to Tolkien, what people did was they'd read Beowulf to see what Beowulf said about pagan Germanic society, or ancient Anglo-Saxon society, or what it said about um, aspects of the society like gift giving, or drinking, or fighting, or things like that. They, they used it as a mine, something that they could dig in and try and find, you know, gemstones out of that would tell about this earlier society rather than reading it as a work of art okay Tolkien was the first one to say read it as art so what does that mean well prior to Tolkien what scholars would do who read Beowulf is they take Grindel Grindel's mother and the dragon Push them off to the side, because they're unimportant. I mean, if you're interested in reading and, get, and gleaning historical or cultural or social information, you know, you got to take, take all the 
miraculous and magical and supernatural stuff and get rid of it because everybody knows all the miraculous, magical, and supernatural stuff isn't real. Right? Tolkien said, whoa, stop. Put it all back in because obviously the poet thought enough about it to focus everything on the monsters. That's why he titles it The Monsters and the Critics. Because prior to Tolkien, the critics discounted the monsters entirely. Tolkien puts the monsters back at the center of the poem. He reads the poem, first of all, as a poem. Okay? It's a work of literary art. In other words, it works like other poems work. It is to be understood and read as other poems are to be understood and read. First and foremost, as what? What's the purpose? First and foremost, to entertain. yes, to entertain, to delight. Okay, if it has a, a didactic component, okay, that's fine too. You got to go back. You know, Horace, first century Roman, said the purpose of literature was to teach and to delight. Okay, so Tolkien says, how does it delight? Well, it's largely through the interaction of the character Beowulf and the monsters. So, what happens in the story? Well, it's not a singer, a single linear narrative like you have, say, in The Lord of the Rings. It kind of, you know, it opens, and then you go off on this little rabbit trail over here, and then you go off over there, and you go off over there. You have a series of what are called episodes and digressions okay, that the poem is full of, that we get taken down. If you've read Beowulf, um, if you have 3010 and you actually do all of Beowulf, you know, then you get pretty familiar with some of these stories and such. Okay? Tolkien looks at those and says they're all part and parcel. They're tied into the central theme. And he says the central theme is, ultimately, the rise and fall of a single heroic individual. We see Beowulf grow strong. We see him in his middle age, very, very briefly. And then we see him fall. We see him die. Okay? And also in that essay, he says about Beowulf, and he says about Anglo-Saxon literature, that they are all about, that all surviving Anglo-Saxon literature is essentially about, ultimately, the death of man in all of his works. Right? Wait, did you repeat that? The death of man, right before that. all of Anglo-Saxon literature, is ultimately about the death of man and all his works. Okay? How many of you have had uh, 3010? Most of you have, not all of you have. Um, if you have 3010 with me, believe me, you'll get a pretty good grounding in old English material. Uh, if you have it with somebody else, you'll probably kind of glance over it quickly to get on to things like Chaucer and other stuff. Um, read the old English poems, The Seafarer and The Wanderer. The Wanderer especially. And you really get drilled into your mind this emphasis on the fleeting nature of everything in human existence, okay, including us. And that if you want to find permanence, you cannot find it here. You can only find it elsewhere, only in, in heaven, the poet behind the wanderer says. Okay? So Tolkien essentially takes that, and he's read everything there is in Anglo-Saxon literature that survives, and sees that mentality permeating everything. It is why, for example, Anglo-Saxon literature has this tone of sorrow, this tone of loss. Most of it can be described as a lament. It's elegiac in that sense, which is why Tolkien says Beowulf, you can't describe Beowulf as a, as a, a um, heroic epic. It's, it, it has heroic elements, yes, but he calls it heroic elegiac. 
So that you have this celebration of sorts of heroism, but you also have this looking back on the part of the, the ninth or 10th century poet, possibly, whenever the poet comes from, you have this looking back on the poet on an earlier age saying, we don't have people like this anymore. We don't have men like this anymore. We don't have people who are as noble as this anymore. Okay. Now all of that is kind of preamble to the Hobbit because there is this undercurrent in the Hobbit of, or, or let me put it this way, there is an infusion of the Anglo-Saxon ethos throughout the Hobbit. Okay? There is almost always, if you scratch just a little bit into the meat of the text, this notion of sadness or this element of loss. Okay? And you will see it um, well, I mean, you're going to see it early on, but you'll kind of see it all throughout. You'll see it in, in there's a little, I don't want to call it a digression, but there's a little comment about, you know, why don't the dwarves hire a hero? Oh, well, because there aren't anymore. Or they're all fight, fighting dragons elsewhere. So instead of getting a big, brawny hero, a Beowulf, what do they get? A midget. They get a hobbit. Okay? They get somebody who stands about three feet tall. That is as unheroic as you can get in terms of physical stature and such. Okay? And then you get, you know, the the ongoing kind of description of hobbits. How do they like life? Peaceful, calm. Kind of lazy. Kind of lazy. Well ordered. Well ordered, lots of, food. lots of food, lots of drink, thank you, good beer, okay, lots of pipe tobacco, okay, kind of your average, I'd say, ordinary Middle England Englishman, and that's in his letters, that's what Tolkien describes. It's kind of the prototype for hobbits. Your everyday, ordinary Englishman who essentially just wants the government to leave its blankety blank nose out of my life. Let me get on with my life. Let me till my little garden, go down to the pub at evening, order bangers and mash and a couple pints of beer, and sit around and smoke and talk and tell stories with my friends. And go back home and sleep and do it all over again the very next day. Kind of without, maybe this would be the one little caveat, without having to go to work. Because yeah. what do the hobbits do? Do they really have jobs per se? I mean, look at Merry and Pippin in The Lord of the Rings. Well, they're privileged. They're privileged. Sam has a job. They're kind of the landed gentry. Okay, as is Frodo, as are Frodo and Bilbo. Sam has a job. He's the gardener. Okay. Somebody runs the Green Dragon at Bywater. We don't, I don't think we're actually told who exactly. You know, you have the miller and the miller's son, Ted Sandyman. Plenty of farmers. Plenty of farmers. Plenty of farmers. Okay. Because you have to have an economy that goes around. So... Look at number, uh, number one. Look at chapter one. Notice the parallel, by the way, with this and the first chapter of Lord of the Rings. An unexpected party, a long expected party, is how Lord of the Rings begins. In a hole of ground there lived a hobbit, not a nasty, dirty, wet hole, <coughs> filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. So you're not in some slime hole, and you're not in a rabbit hole. Had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. Okay, So you have a green door, 
and a shiny yellow brass knob right in the middle. Notice the attention to detailed imagery. Tolkien is going to create for our minds the secondary world that he talks about in the fairy story essay into which our minds can go and live. The door opens onto a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel. Notice it's not a tunnel with dirt and ends of plants sticking through, but it's a very comfortable tunnel without smoke with paneled walls, floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs, lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. The Hobbit was fond of visitors. The tunnel wound on and on, going straight into the side of the hill, etc., etc. Okay. No upstairs, but there were bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, wardrobes. He had whole rooms devoted just to clothes. Uh, kitchens, notice plural. Dining rooms, all on the same floor. And we find out this hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit. His name was Baggins. They'd lived in the neighborhood of the hill for time out of mind, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And then we get the description of hobbits. What is a hobbit? Now, for a long time it had been thought Tolkien probably coined the word hobbit. We do know now, however, that the word hobbit does show up in some texts. Um, one from the 1830s, and there's another one, if I remember correctly, earlier than that. But it is not at all evident that Tolkien knew about these texts. Were they like, the, I mean, what were they? What did they use to describe? I don't remember, to tell you the truth. Not, one of them not these. these. Not these. Yeah. I think one of them's a, a goblin of some sort, or that's some kind of goblin bugbear, or okay. something like that. Yeah, I. It, it was in some place really obscure that he was unlikely to have ever. Yeah. Now, to, I should have mentioned, you know, Tolkien working on the Oxford English Dictionary. If I remember correctly, he worked in the Essence. And W's. And W's, okay. Um, it's, he worked there after he left Leeds, came to Oxford, etc. Um, but he probably didn't have any reason to be delving around in the H's at all. Uh, but you never know with Tolkien because he was a squirrely kind of person. I mean, he had a, as he called it, you know, his secret vice was language. He loved languages. And I don't know, have I talked about, you know, his command of languages? You know, by the age of, by the age of eight, his mother had already begun teaching him French. He knew Latin, and he was learning Greek at eight. At eight. Okay. Um, by the time he went off to uh, the First World War in 1915, see, and I always get his and Lewis's birth dates confused. Tolkien was born in 92. So he would have been about 23 when he went off to war. By the time he went off to war, he'd already um, learned, obviously, not only French, Latin, and Greek, but he'd had German, he'd had Old English, he'd studied Gothic. He'd begun to teach himself, if I remember correctly, Finnish and Welsh. Um, by the 1930s, he, I don't have them all memorized, but he knew, was able to read 14 different languages. I mean, so language obviously was a gift. It was something he could pick up um, fairly easily. And if you, if you know the, the Elvish languages and you learn Finnish, you can see some pretty clear similarities between uh, them. And the interesting thing there is Finnish is not an Indo-European language. Okay? Finnish is a completely separate branch. And by Indo-European, I mean the, the language group that almost all the languages of Europe and Russia and India 
in Persia, okay, um, Greek, Italian, Latin, uh, Greek, Italic, Celtic languages, Germanic languages, Russian, all evolve from it. It's just one small group. Finnish is a completely separate thing. It's not at all related, okay? Uh, Hebrew was one he knew because he assisted in the translation of the book of Job, I Jonah. think, of Jonah, for the Jerusalem Bible, okay? So, I mean, language was a rare gift for him. So, he goes on and tells us about hobbits. They are or were a little people, about half our height, smaller than the bearded dwarves. Hobbits have no beards. Little or no magic about them except for what? Yeah, they're very sly, let's say, okay? They're inclined to be fat in the stomach. They dress in bright colors, chiefly green and yellow. They wear no shoes because their feet have leathery soles and warm brown hair like the stuff on their heads, which is curly. They've got uh, long, clever brown fingers, good-natured faces. They laugh deep, fruity laughs. I have no idea what a fruity laugh is <laughs> as opposed to a vegetable-y laugh or a mineral-y laugh, or, you know. Um, especially after dinner, which they have twice a day when they can get it. Okay. Notice what we're not told. And we're not told this also in The Lord of the Rings. Where they came from. Where they came from, okay. They don't have double lunches. You know, the whole second lunch thing. It's completely Peter Jackson's invention, okay? We, we will get told that when possible, they like to have meals five times a day. So, I mean, you could probably infer from that that they have, I don't know, one breakfast, two lunches, two dinners, one, two breakfasts, two lunches, one, whatever, okay? So we find out more about Bilbo's family, Belladonna and such, and then we get um, this passage. By some curious chance, one morning long ago in the quiet of the world, when there was less noise and more green, and the hobbits were still numerous and prosperous, Bilbo Baggins was standing at his front door after breakfast, smoking an enormous long wooden pipe that reached nearly down to his woolly toes. Now I've got friends, probably younger, former students of mine, think they're all, you know, Hobbity and Gandalf against because they get these long church warden pipes. This isn't a church warden. A church warden pipe has a stem that's about, ranges from 7 to about 12 inches long. How long is Bilbo's pipe? Okay, he's about 3 feet tall. So if his mouth's here, that's it, about 4 feet. So it, the pipe's like 2 and a half feet long. This is a long pipe, Okay. In comes Gandalf. Gandalf. If you had heard only a quarter of what I have heard about him, who is the I? Is, is the I Bilbo? No. Bilbo's not the narrator. So a narrator might be mistaken for the professor. Um, what professor? For Professor Tolkien. Okay. He at various points, not here, but in, rather in Lord of the Rings, professes to have found the Red Book of West March, of which he is merely a translator. So assuming that we are still in that same, that this is the mind frame we are that, in, then that would be the fictitious Professor Tolkien who is translating. Exactly. The, the same way, by the way, C.S. Lewis does the same thing with the supposed manuscript of screw tape letters, which he found, I think it is in the back seat of a cab, okay, or um, one of our great American authors, a distant ancestor of mine, Nathaniel Hawthorne does with the custom house behind the scarlet letter. He's not writing the story, he's merely retelling what somebody else has already told. This is an age-old fiction to lend credibility to the story, to lend believability to the story, okay? So, Gandalf comes by. 
Tales and adventures sprouted up all over the place wherever he went and in the most extraordinary fashion. fashion. He had not been down that way under the hill for ages and ages, not since his old friend the Took died, in fact, and the hobbits had almost forgotten what he looked like. Okay. So all that Bilbo sees is an old man with a staff. Tall, pointed blue hat, long gray cloak, silver scarf over which a white beard hung down below his waist, and immense black boots. So he's, you know, quite the striking image. And now Bilbo addresses him. Good morning! Sun was shining, grass was green. Gandalf looks at him from under his bushy eyebrows. Notice that stick out further than the brim of his hat. Okay, now his hat, it's, this isn't like a witch's hat, you know, where it's just a cone that sticks down on his head. This is a wide-brimmed hat. Okay, this is not, I don't think, hyperbole. It's supposed to be his eyebrows really going out there. Okay, what do you mean? Do you wish me a good morning? Or mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? Gandalf here sounds like, if you're familiar with C.F. Lewis's story, the man he nicknames the Great Knock in his development. And I don't know if, if there's any relationship between that. The Great Knock was a man named, um, I think his real name was Kirk who was Lewis's tutor when he left Malvern College and went to study, live with the tutor in Surrey before going up to Oxford. And the one thing this guy taught the young C.S. Lewis was never accept a premise. Never accept an assumption. Challenge everything. So, good morning. Really? Is it? What do you mean by that? Okay. that? And that's, Lewis developed a reputation for being argumentative to the extent that people would kind of shy away getting into arguments with him because he was like a pit bull. He would chase every comet down to its logical consequences. Okay, We'll talk about, quite a bit more about Lewis later. So, what do you mean? All of them at once. Bilbo's being magnanimous. Okay, he's had a good breakfast. He's sitting there, he's smoking a big old pipe. He feels good. And a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors into the bargain. If you have a pipe, vouch you, sit down, have a fill of mine. No hurry, we have all the day before us. Life's a breeze for Bilbo. He sits down on his seat, crosses his legs, blows out a be beautiful gray ring of smoke. Gandalf, very pretty, but I have no time to blow smoke rings this morning. I am looking for someone to share in an adventure that I am arranging. And it's very difficult to find anyone. Bilbo, I should think so in these parts. We are plain quiet folk. Have no use for adventures. What happens with adventures? Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. Because what happens when you get caught in an adventure? <laughs> Makes you late for dinner. Okay. What else? You're actually doing something. Okay. That's not comfortable. Takes you out of your ring of comfort, your comfort zone. They change your life. If you're used to just being able to sit down on your seat, blow smoke rings the whole day long, drink from a you know tankard or whatever, have friends over. Go over to their house and do that day in and day out. To use the phrase Paul used earlier, it means your life is well ordered. There's no surprise. Everything is how it's supposed to be. And yet, adventures take you outside of that and introduce what? Doubt, unknown. Doubt, danger. Peril? 
chaos, possibly sorrow. Why did the Bilbo has appointed himself an expert on adventures? Notice, he says, they make you late for dinner. I can't think what anybody sees in them. Sticks his thumb behind his braces. That's his suspenders. Blows out another smoke ring. Starts taking out his letters and looking at them. Now, what is he showing there? Or what is he being there? When he starts taking out his letters, he's invited this individual to sit and smoke with him. And he starts pulling out like a novel. He's being rude. Okay. Begin to read, pretending to take no more, no more notice of the old man. He decided he was not quite his sort and wanted him to go away. He wants him to go away, but he won't say, will you please go away? You're bothering me now. The old man did not move. He stood leaning on a stick and gazing at the hobbit without saying anything. So what is Gandalf doing? Is he being rude? No. He hasn't been asked to leave. So he's just standing there, staring. Now, if he went to Rutherford County Schools, Gandalf would learn that actually what he's doing is violent. This is an act of violence, according to Rutherford County Schools, staring at somebody. Yeah. Well, he's violating several standards of, of habit propriety. Is he? Hey, yes, he is. What? Because if Bilbo did that to any other hobbit, except for maybe a sack, sack bill baggins, wow. they would get the clue, apologize, and move on. They would get the clue, but Gandalf isn't a member of this culture. Oh, no, he's outside, he feels happy. But he's being rude by hobbit standards. Okay. He feels free to because, well, he's, he's a wizard. He's, he's a wizard, he's not a hobbit, he's been around a thousand years, etc. Okay? So, Bilbo, finally. Good morning! We don't want any adventures here, thank you. You might try over the hill or across the water on your way to grandmother's house, you know, as it were. There's a lot of things you do use good morning for. Now you mean that you want to get rid of me and that it won't be good till I move off. Is Gandalf correct? Yes. He hit that nail perfectly. No, not at all, not at all, my dear sir. I, mean, I don't think I know your name. Yes, yes, my dear sir. And I do know your name. Bilbo's kind of flustered at this point. You do know my name, though you don't remember that I belong to it. In other words, Gandalf is saying, I'm famous. You just don't know who the I is that is speaking to you. I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me. Whatever that means. Like to a think. Monster. Is that a cookie monster, like a Muppet? Okay. <laughs> To think that I should have lived to be good morning by Belladonna Tuxan. In other words, he seems to be saying, you're not the first person to good morning me. <laughs> and this good morninging that you're doing is not peculiar to you. It's a kind of a hobbit, you know, uh, trademark, let's say. Gandalf, Gandalf, not the wandering wizard that gave old took a pair of magic diamond studs that fastened themselves and never came undone till ordered. It sounds like <coughs> Harry Potter magic. You know, the magic that, that wizards play on poor unsuspecting mus muggles, making their keys, you know, uh, disappear, I was going to say dissolve, disappear and then return and such. Not the fellow who used to tell such wonderful tales at parties about dragons and goblins and giants and the rescue princesses. Not the man that used to make fireworks. I remember those. Old Took used to have them. Okay. Not the Gandalf who is responsible for so many quiet lads and lasses going off into the blue for mad adventures. Do we ever anywhere else in Tolkien's entire Middle Earth oeuvre hear about any of these stories. No. They're not in the Silmarillion. They're not in the history of Middle Earth. Okay. Anything from climbing trees to visiting elves, elves or sailing in ships, 
sailing to other shores. Ooh, now that's getting kind of. Isn't that a post LOTR revision? Uh, it might be. It might be. Bless me. Life used to be quite inter. Life used to be what? It's okay. Quite interesting. We're going to see Frodo make the exact same kind of, what do I want to call it, slip in his interview with Gandalf in the chapter, um, The Shadow of the Past. Okay, they're talking about the ring and destroying the ring, and Frodo is going to say, I really do wish to destroy the ring, or er, to have it destroyed. Because what he first said was, I, I will be the agent, I will be the actor. I want to destroy the ring. And then he's going to realize what he's saying. And he's going to say, no, no, not me. I want to live fat, dumb, and happy here at Bag End. I want somebody else to destroy it. Okay? I mean, you used to upset things badly in these parts. Once upon a time, in the old fairy tale days. I beg your pardon, but I had no idea you were still in business. What does that still in business mean? Sucking air is what it means. Where else should I be? All the same, I'm pleased to find you remember something about me. You seem to remember my fireworks kindly at any rate. And that's not without hope. So, I'll give you what you asked for. Bilbo's like, oh, I haven't asked for anything. Yes, you have, twice now. My pardon, I give it you. In fact, I'll go so far as to send you on this adventure. Very amusing for me. Very good for you. Good how? The same kind of good as in good morning? So what does Gandalf mean here by good for you? Morally improving. Like it'll build character. Yeah. Morally improving, it'll build character. Okay. What builds character? Adversity. <laughs> Difficulty. Adversity. Suffering builds character. So, he's going to send Bilbo off to suffer. <laughs> I don't want any adventures, thank you. Not today. Good morning. <laughs> Why not tomorrow? Come tomorrow. Goodbye. With that, the hobbit turns, scuttled inside his round green door. And then he thinks, why did I ask him to tea? Because he did. He said, come to tea anytime you like. Why not tomorrow? Gandalf, in the meantime, is laughing, and he goes up and he scratches a mark on Bilbo's door, and Bilbo completely had forgotten about Gandalf, and the next day comes. And just before tea time, you get a tremendous ring on the front doorbell, and then he remembers, and there's a dwarf. Dwarf with a blue beard, blue beard. Tucked into a golden belt, very bright eyes under his dark green hood. Dwellin at your service, he says with a low bow. Bilbo Baggins at yours. Come, have some tea. Okay, another ring at the bell. Oh, so you've got your last, he thinks it's Gandalf. And there's another dwarf. Odd-looking dwarf on the step with a white beard, a scarlet hood. Hops inside. Okay. And this keeps going on, and Bilbo keeps inviting them in for tea. Okay. Balin says, a little beer would suit me better if it's all the same to you, my good sir. Don't mind some cake, seed cake. No, getting rather particular here. Here's another ring at the belt. It's, it's got to be Gandalf. Nope. Two more dwarves. Blue hoods, silver belts, yellow beards. Each of them carried a bag of tools and a spade. Keely and Philly, they see that Dwellin and Balin are already there. Okay. More, four at the door. And in come Dory, Nori, Ori, and Oin, and Gloin. Sorry, five actually. So now Bilbo's got coffee on the hearth. He's got tea being poured. 
He's pulling out the bottles of beer, or kegs at that point. <laughs> he thinks Gandalf's there, and here come four more, and Gandalf behind them. Bifur, Bofur, Bomber, and Thorin. And Bifur, Bofur, and Bomber bow low, hang up two yellow hoods and a pale green one, and in comes Thorn, Oakenshield, and Saul. Not at all pleased at falling flat on Bilbo's mat with Bifur, Bofur, and Bomber on top of him. Okay? Thirteen hoods hanging on his pegs. Maybe he shouldn't have had so many pegs and like so many visitors. Okay? And they all start asking for varieties of things to eat. Um, red wine, tea, raspberry jam, and apple tart, mince pies and cheese, pork pie and salad, more cakes, more ale, more coffee, and Gandalf wants eggs on top of it, okay? So he then says, I suppose you're all going to stay for supper? Of course, you know, <laughs> and they do. So they start to sing. And hold on a second. Let me see if I can. I should have queued this up, but I didn't think about it until just now. Why do we not have... more sound? Why is that showing the DVD player? PC. Hey, okay, here we go. Sound. Well, this will work partially, even though you don't get the sound. Do the dwarves match your... Uh, Why not? They look like cartoons. They, they look all ge almost generic. Okay. They don't have this, their own colors. They don't have the colored hoods. They all have red or gray or brown beards. They're and short pretty. beards. Yeah, yeah. They look like oh. I'm as... Generic as I can possibly get. That's so tall. They're too tall. Really tall. You can just barely yeah, they look like, hear they the look sound. Like men, not, they look like hairy men rather than dwarves. The hell just look like Hogwarts. God, oh, he's an idiot. Such an idiot. What, me? No, Peter oh, Jackson. Right. Sorry. <laughs> no, Peter Jackson. <laughs> Peter Jackson's like... <clears throat> Just makes me, just makes me angry. No, so not not you at all. There's a comment at the very top saying, "Haven't read the books, have you?" Yeah, I mean it's. 
I, I was asking my kids the other day, I said, how in the world is he going to get three leads? Depends how big the check he gets is. Oh, I got three leads. Oh, of movies. course he's going to add a love story. Yeah. Okay. But he's got three movies from this. How many movies were there from The Lord of the Rings? 1,200 pages in Lord of the Rings. 300 in this. Okay. Well, there probably will be. So, we have the dwarves sing their little song about chipping the glasses and everything. Okay. And then we're told, page 13, I'm going to move along more quickly after this. The darkness fills the room and they start to chant. The far over the misty mountains cold. And this is the part I was hoping to, you know, this is the part from what I've seen looks good. At least they get the chanting right. I mean, close your eyes so you can put your own dwarves in there and such. Okay? So, why are they there? For an adventure. For an adventure, why else? Why do they need someone to go? Because of the door in the mountain. Oh, okay. Do they know about the door in the mountain? They don't at this point. How many dwarves? Thirteen. It's an unlucky number. They need a fourteenth. Why else? And they're under confused. Do they want to like steal every piece of treasure one by one using their burglar? Because probably not. That was not very clear. They want a burglar. They want to go get some. Of the treasure. We don't know how much. Okay? So, Bilbo is hired as the burglar. They go through the terms of the agreement, the contract, etc. He will get 114. Okay? But they won't guarantee that he lives. <laughs> he wakes up the next morning. They've left. Bilbo has to run off and find them. And this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really skip through a lot of stuff quickly. They get captured by the trolls. How does Gandalf rescue them? He acts like one of the trolls. He makes them fight within each other until the sun comes up. And he takes his staff and he smacks it on the ground and he makes a bright light? Like in the trailer? No. He just he digs with them until they turn to stone from the sun. He essentially does, if, familiar, if you're familiar with the play, he does what Puck does in A Midsummer Night's Dream. He pretends he's one of the trolls. He throws his voice like a ventriloquist. Okay? And keeps them arguing about how to eat slash cook whatever, hobbits and burrow hobbits, okay? until the sun comes up. Because this is a Tolkienian invention. The idea is that if a troll... Is up and the daylight hits, they turn to stone. Why? Because trolls are of the earth. They are essentially living earth. Okay? So, how do the dwarves think of Bilbo after this little um, experience? It, has he endeared himself to them more? No, I don't think they're terribly impressed. No, they're not terribly <laughs> impressed. Because he almost got them eaten. Okay. So they take some blades out of the troll hole. And Gandalf says, in mine, page 43, in that chapter most written, just before the end, these look like good blades. They were not made by any troll, nor by any smith among men in these parts and days. But when we can read the runes on them, we shall know more about them. Can Gandalf not read elvish runes? It's a really good question. Apparently here he can't. Because he also apparently can't read the map of Thorns. Well, no, that, that's a different case. That only Elrond can read. Does Elrond appear to have more wisdom in Lord of the Rings than Gandalf does? 
not in LOTR. Not in Lord of the Rings. Here? Yes, or a different kind of wisdom. There are, what I'm trying to, to get at is there are some um, dissimilarities, some pretty jarring dissimilarities between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And I want you to keep those dissimilarities in mind because they're there for a reason. I mean, they're, they're not there for a reason as he writes this, obviously, because he has no idea of The Lord of the Rings. But when he starts working on The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien makes some intentional changes between this novel and the later ones. Okay? So, let's skip some more. And uh, they make their way to Elrond's house. And we hear the elves singing their beautiful, deep, solemn, mystical song. Full of the sadness for the longing of a man. Oh, what are you doing and where are you going? Your ponies need shoeing. The river is flowing. Oh, tra la 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 here down in the, or lally, here down in the valley, etc. Okay? And they meet Elrond. And Elrond tells them, skipping a few pages and page 52, that these elves, uh, excuse me, these swords are not troll make. They are old swords, very old swords of the high elves of the west, my kin. They were made in Gondolin for the goblin wars. This thorn, the runes named Orcrest, the goblin cleaver in the ancient tongue of Gondolin. It was a famous blade. This Gandalf was Glamdrain, foe hammer that the king of Gondolin once wore, who, which was Tuor? Uh, Turgon. Turgon, okay. Now, people reading this in 1937, they're like, what? What's Gondolin? What's the language of Gondolin? You get up to the Lord of the Rings, and you hear Gondolin again. What's Gondolin? Okay. How long do you have to wait? To 1977. So if you first read Lord of the Rings, like, um, what's his name who played Sarah Man? Chris. Christopher, Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee in 1954. And you've been reading it every year. It wasn't until 1977 that you could find out what Gondola was. Exciting. Okay, exciting, exciting stuff. Because then you read the Silmarillion and you go, Oh, okay. If you read the Silmarillion first, before ever having looked at The Hobbit or the Silmarillion, I would almost bet you can't finish it. Because it, it, it just doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to on its own. It only makes sense as background to these stories, okay? To give these stories the needed depth in history to make Middle-earth seem like an old, old world, okay? It's the same kind of thing, and because he gets it from Lord of the Rings and stuff, it's the same kind of thing uh, George Lucas did with the beginning of the original Star Wars. In a galaxy not far away, Long time ago. Okay? And then you see that great big star destroyer come over you. And does it look like, if you've ever seen the film, does it look like the spaceships of 2001 A Space Odyssey? No. How are they different? Anybody remember? It looks used. 2001 A Space Odyssey ships are bright, spanking clean, like they just came off the assembly line. The Star Destroyer has blast marks. It's like it's got exhaust marks. It's dirty and grungy. Okay, implying, telling you, this is not new. This is something that's been going on for a long time. Okay, so he goes on. Um, Thorn talks about he's going to keep the sword. Then they talk about the map and the moon runes, etc. And so we go through over hill and under hill again. I'm, I'm skipping a lot because 
a lot of this is kind of fluff. Um, They get captured in the caves, and we get chapter five, Riddles in the Dark, okay? Which Tolkien revises from the first edition, first, um, yeah, first edition of The Hobbit, okay? Because he has to change some things. And we meet Gollum. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about it, other than I've got a couple of marks here. I'll point out. Bilbo has this conversation with Gollum. They go through the riddle game. Bilbo wins the riddle game. And at the end of it, Gollum goes off. He goes off to his little island in the Black Lake. And Gollum says, um, on mine it's middle of 82. Not a real precious no. What has it got in its pockets? Bilbo asks, what have you lost? But now the light in Gollum's eyes had become a green fire. And it was coming swiftly nearer. Now, green fire, Tolkien would know because of his knowledge of Anglo-Saxon and Old Norse languages. Green fire is the color of Grendel's eyes. And it's also the color of um, the eyes of this, for lack of a better word, what do I want to call this thing? A troll, let's say. In an Old Norse poem um, of this troll named Glamour. Okay. So, and what it means is danger. <laughs> this is the warning sign. So Bilbo kills Gollum and escapes, right? Why doesn't he kill Gollum? But does he have the right to? Is, is Gollum trying to kill him? Yeah. He feels sad. He's, he, he empathizes with him. He's lost something very important to him. He's yeah, lost something very important. What else? I mean, that's pretty key, but what else? What does the riddle game tell Bilbo? He's about been Gollum? Very, very long. He's been there a long time. He's what else? He's, he's an intelligent creature. He's lived there. They have a shared experience. They have a shared history. Gollum knows the same riddles. That indicates there is something in their distant past. Not Bilbo's grandmother once dated Gollum or something like that. Okay? A shared cultural inheritance. And he sees what Gollum looks like now. Gollum's obviously been here a long time. Bilbo doesn't know anything about how long Gollum's been here. He doesn't know how old Gollum is. He doesn't know how Gollum got to be Gollum. Okay? But he puts on the ring and he escapes. And we get out of the frying pan into the fire. He creeps near the dwarves and he hears them talking with Gandalf. And he says to himself, page 91, I'll give them all a surprise. Gandalf, he is my friend and not a bad little chap. I feel responsible for him. I wish to goodness you had not lost him. One of the doors. He's been more trouble than use so far. If we have got to go back now into those abominable tunnels to look for him, then drat him, I say. So if we take that dwarf opinion as being representative of all the dwarves, what are the dwarves willing to do? Yeah. Cut their losses and leave. Okay. Gandalf, whatever did you drop him for, Dory? You would have dropped him if a goblin had suddenly grabbed your leg from behind in the dark, tripped up your feet, and kicked you in the back. Did he really drop Bilbo? No, he just pulled off. Bilbo's head! 
hit a low overhang. Boom, got knocked backwards. Okay? Why didn't you pick him up again? Hello? Goblins all over trying to kill us. You expect me to... Okay? Bilbo. And here's the burglar. And they all jump. Okay? Ballard is not quite sure about this. So Bilbo tells them the story about how he escaped from Gollum. And Gal Gandalf's like, Mr. Be says, Mr. Baggins says more about him than you can guess. And he gave Bilbo a queer look from under his bushy eyebrows as he said this, and the hobbit wondered if he guessed at the part of his tale that he had left out. And you know, if Gandalf were Albus Dumbledore, he would know exactly what happened because he would, he would have read his mind. Okay? So they go on. And what do I want to pick up? We have the rescue by the eagles. They get taken to my favorite passage in just about all of the book. Uh, near Bayorn's house, and they stay with Bayorn, who is what? He's a berserker. The literal word berserker means bare shirt. Okay, it's a shapeshifter. <laughs> bayorn can go out at night, turn into the shape of a huge bear. Okay, which he does, and we're going to see Bayorn only briefly alluded to in The Lord of the Rings. So, Gandalf says to Beorn, I'm a wizard. I've heard of you if you've not heard of me. You've heard of my good cousin Radagast? Yes, not a bad fellow as wizards go. I used to see him now and again. And then he asks him, now I know who you are or who you say you are. What do you want? They want a little rest. So they have to call in the dwarves one by one. And they come in. Okay. They stay with Bayorn. They get their bags filled. Bayorn gives them leave. And we go to chapter, the very end of the chapter. If it's widely known, like Gandalf comes and knows how the Knox supposed to be, they all know these social, I guess, proprieties. Is it just Bjorn being Bjorn that he's getting upset that they're saying at your service? I think it's he just thinks dwarves are full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably largely it. Um, Bayorn is not necessarily I don't know, but one for ceremony. That is, Gandalf knows the correct thing you do for Bayorn. I don't think the dwarves do. I don't think the dwarves have ever seen Bayorn, so they don't know necessarily what to do. Okay, um, But I think Bayorn, I mean, he's a He's a gruff, wild character. That's why Gandalf's just like, you know, be on your best behavior. Because what could Bayorn do after all? Turn into a bear. Turn into a bear and eat you, you know? Is there a connection between Bayorn and Tom Bombadil? No. Um, well, what do you mean by connection? Uh, I mean, I don't know. They both. Uh, Friendship or relationship or yeah, existential? Same, like the same. No. No, Tom Bombadil is completely other. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about Tom Bombadil when we get there. Okay? So they get ready to leave, and they get ready to go through the forest of Mirkwood. Bayorn tells them, stay to the path. Gandalf tells them, stay to the path. And they're like, well, you're coming with us, right? And he says, no, he's got other business to attend to. This is probably, you know, one of the things, this will be, you know, film two. The, the routing of the necromancer from Dol Guldur and the whole White Council thing and Gandalf's little, uh, it seems to be implied, tryst or relationship with uh, Galadriel. I guess Celeborn is not in the picture yet or something. Or I think they have an open Celeborn, marriage. I think whenever someone says Celeborn the wise, they like raise an eyebrow or roll their eyes or something. Yeah, like he's he never really comes across as being wise all that wise. It's a sarcastic title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, 
Kilborn the oh, simple minded really is what they're saying. They call him John Mantine. Okay. So they go off into the forest, they get captured by the spiders, Bilbo rescues them, they get captured by the elves and all that kind of stuff. I wanted they get captured a lot. They get captured a lot. Okay. Um, I'm gonna skip a whole bunch. Bilbo rescues them from the elves. Yeah, we get to see a drunk elf and all that. Um, I want to pick up with chapter 12, Inside Information. Thorne says, Now is the time for our esteemed Mr. Baggins, who has proven himself a good companion on our long road, a hobbit full of courage and a resource far exceeding his size. So now it's the time what? For him to perform the service for which he is included in our company. Bilbo, if you mean you think it is my job to go into the secret passages first, O Thorin, Thrain's son, Oakenshield, may your beard grow ever longer, say so at once, and have done. I might refuse. I have got you out of two messes already, which were hardly in the original bargain. So that I am, I think, already owed some reward. In other words, I've already, quote unquote, burgled. Not really, but. Third time pays for all. So he says, but I'll go and have a peek. Page, uh, next page. He did not expect a chorus of volunteers, so he wasn't disappointed. The most that can be said for the dwarves is this. They intended to pay Bilbo really handsomely for his services. They had brought him to do a nasty job for them, and they did not mind the poor little fellow doing it if he would. In other words, they weren't going to stand up suddenly, have a uh, growth of heroic genes inside and say, no, no, Bilbo, we don't want you to do this. We'll do it ourselves. No. But they would all have done their best to get him out of trouble if he got into it, as they did in the case of the trolls at the beginning of their adventures, before they had any particular reason for being grateful to him. But notice which they did not do when Bobo was lost in the Misty Mountains. Okay? And then our narrator tells us this. There it is. Dwarves are not heroes. But calculating folk with a great idea of the value of money. Some are tricky and treacherous and pretty bad lots. Some are not but are decent enough people like Thorin and company, period, <laughs> if you don't expect too much. Okay? So if you don't expect a dwarf to go out of his way to help you, then they're pretty good people. So do you really want a dwarf guiding, you know, watching your back? <laughs> mm, not really. So Bilbo goes in, and he sees Smaug. And if you've never seen it before, I strongly encourage you to get on YouTube, because I'm almost positive it's there. Get on YouTube and, Google, and, and search for Smaug and Bilbo or something like that. It's the old animated version. I think it's Rankin and Bass. Okay. And the only reason I want you to do this is to listen to the voice of Smaug. Okay. The actor who did the voice of Smaug, and this is 78, 79, something like that. The actor who did the voice of Smaug was Richard Boone, who had the, you know, next to maybe Sam Elliott, who, who's got a wonderful voice for Smaug. Richard Boone did the voice of Smaug, and it is perfect. Okay, um, The upcoming movie, the voice of Smaug, it's just not going to work, is if you've seen the BBC's newest version of Sherlock Holmes, it's Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. I keep wanting to say Bandersnatch or Cumberbund. Okay. It's Benedict 
See, I did it again. Well, Cumberbatch. He has the most English name in, in the country. He's got a fantastic name, and he's a fantastic Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock is. Okay. Sherlock is a fantastic show, okay? But he doesn't have a voice for Smaug. Watson plays Bilbo. Yeah, Watson plays Bilbo, and he looks pretty good, I think. Okay? Um, but Google or YouTube that and just watch that little scene, okay? Because every time... I, would, I didn't grow up watching that. I've only seen it two or three times. But, I mean, Richard Boone is so ingrained in here. You know, the, the voice for Gandalf, for me, is given not by Ian McKellen. It's a BBC audio adaptation of uh, both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings with a, a British actor named Sir Michael Hordern, who did the voice of Gandalf. And again, it's also just superb. So he sees... Smaug, and what does Smaug learn from him, and how? Bilbo thinks he's being all wise and sneaky and subtle, but he gives himself a series of epithets, one of which is Barrel Rider. Smaug knows what he's talking about. Okay. So Smaug goes and destroys Lake Town. And the men from Lake Town, Bard, kills him. And the men from Lake Town come and demand a piece of the treasure. How does Tolkien wrap this up? I mean, this is a classic kind of adventure quest. How does we get what do I do with it? We get the Battle of Five Armies, right? Who are who's the five armies? We have dwarves, elves, men, orcs or goblins. Sorry. Goblins riding wargs. wargs. Who's the fifth? Eagles. Okay. What about the, the bats? No, I think that's the eagles. They're, 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 they're described they're thick as... a swarm of bats. Or is there? Okay. Yeah, I don't think... Yeah, I don't think they're actually counted as part of the armies and such. Okay. So you get the battle, and then the battle ends, and I'm skipping the whole thing about Bilbo... I almost said Frodo finding the Arkenstone and claiming that for his own and then sneaking over and turning traitor, going to the men and elves' side and then all that. Okay. And you get the end of the battle. Chapter 18, The Return Journey. Okay. They see Bilbo alive. And Thorne is brought in. And notice Bilbo is, uh, excuse me, Thorne is dying. And Thorin tells Bilbo, I go now to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers until the world is renewed. Is there anything in the Silmarillion about dwarves in the world being renewed? No. Okay. Since I, hold on, since I leave now all gold and silver and go where it is of little worth, I wish to part in friendship. And then he says, there is more in you of good than you know, child of the kindly West. Now, West is capitalized. That doesn't mean the, the Western part of Middle Earth, like the Shire, is west of the Lonely Mountain. It means you really are a child of Valinor. And he's saying that on the basis of Bilbo's actions. Okay? If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. Well, who values hoarded gold? Dragons and dwarves. What starts the battle? 
He refuses to give any way. Who is demanding it? Men? Elves? The two children of Elugatar? Dwarves? Children of Aule, if you want. Goblins? Children of Sauron? <laughs> Morgoth? Who's the only one not claiming? Bilbo. Where does Bilbo fall in the children of? We don't know. It's like hobbits are somehow, I don't want to say they're immune, okay? But they don't have the same greedy, innate tendencies. It seems that men and elves and dwarves have. And the things that are derived from men and elves and dwarves. Okay? So, Bilbo and Gandalf go on. And they make their way home. And Gandalf tells Bilbo just before the end almost. Something is the matter with you. You are not the hobbit that you were. And Bilbo gets, arrives home and finds out his home's been you know, seemingly broken into. He's been away for a long time. The SBs, it's not an accident, Tolkien uses those initials. <clears throat> the SBs have gone in and such. And Gandalf tells him just before he leaves, very last paragraph. When Balin comes and says there's a new master, they're making songs, etc. Bilbo, then the prophecies of the old songs have turned out to be true after a fashion. Gandalf, of course. And why should not they prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself. You know, notice what Tolkien's doing there. He's telling, Gandalf is telling Bilbo, you entered into the stories of the past. You don't think the stories of the past wouldn't come true because you became part of them, do you? No. You don't really suppose, do you? That all your adventures, adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck, just for your sole benefit, do you? Okay. The reason I point that out, when we get to the end of the Lord of the Rings, and I know I'm a couple minutes late, when we get to the, order, the very end of the Lord of the Rings, before Gandalf goes off to talk with Tom Bombadil, he's going to tell the hobbits who go back to the Shire, you have been prepared for this. That is, what's facing you in the Shire. All your travels and adventures are for this. Like, the whole War of the Ring was so that they could take care of themselves in the Shire from that point. Okay? All right, we'll stop there.